I'm Lisa Fletcher. Welcome to The Stream. Today, can you be big and beautiful? We look at why the media, and even many women, tend to say no as body image issues grow. Our digital producer, Malika Bilal, is rounding up all your live feedback, and as always, we'll be getting much of it into the program as much as possible. So, Malika, we've been sending out video questions all day, mm -hmm. not video questions, Twitter questions all day mm -hmm. to our community. Um, what are you hearing back? Well, one of the questions we ask is whether or not Western media dictates or influences non-Western perceptions of beauty. We got lots of responses from all over the world, including this one from Scott, who says, it influences but doesn't dictate non-Western ideals. U.S. media is so widely consumed, it'd be hard to imagine it had no impact. So for those of you at home, if you agree with that sentiment, let us know. Join the conversation using the hashtag AJStream. All right, and sitting between Malika and me is Dr. Dana Adele. She's the executive director of Spark, a movement aimed at pushing back against the increasingly sexualized images of girls and women in the media. Dana, welcome to the stream. Thank you. I'm glad to have you here. Good to Remember, you can join us in a number of different ways, but if you want to be a part of the show like these folks behind me on Google+, just add the stream to your circles and then you can be in the stream. Hi everyone, my name is Tom Shadiak. I am a writer, director, and producer of such films as Ace Ventura, The Nutty Professor, and Bruce Almighty, and I am in the stream. And he is an amazing guy. We had him on last week. They say beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but based on Western media portrayals, a beautiful woman is almost always 180 centimeters and weighs 50 kilograms. That's roughly 5 foot 11 and 110 pounds. Although the waistline of today's woman has expanded, in fact, the U.S. is considered to be in an obesity crisis, models have become even thinner, weighing 23% less than the average woman. 20 years ago, it was only 8%. And now, in certain cases, creating the idealized body image is reaching new extreme levels. In what's been coined as Barbie flu, women are undergoing plastic surgery. That is a real woman right there. To look like a human doll or a Japanese anime character. And now some celebrities, they're beginning to reject this unrealistic standard. Recently, celebrity musician Lady Gaga was lambasted in the media for gaining a few pounds. In response, she posted half-naked pictures of herself and encouraged others to do the same in what she calls a body revolution. Another incident that grabbed headlines this month was when a news anchor in the U.S. state of Wisconsin publicly addressed an email she'd received that criticized her weight. Take a look. The truth is, I am overweight. You could call me fat, and yes, even obese on a doctor's chart. But to the person who wrote me that letter, do you think I don't know that? That your cruel words are pointing out something that I don't see? You don't know me. You are not a friend of mine. You are not a part of my family, and you have admitted that you don't watch this show. So you know nothing about me but what you see on the outside. And I am much more than a number on a scale. So, do we associate being overweight with being ugly? And do Western standards dictate global perceptions of the ideal body? Joining us via Skype from Sacramento, California, is attorney and former model Uduak Oduwak. She specializes in law and fashion with many clients who are models or who are in the entertainment industry. Uduak, welcome to the stream. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. How are you? Very well. We're thrilled to have you with us today. Thank you. So, Dana, I want to start with you. This is something that women have been talking about for a long time. Um, it, but it seems that as American women are getting a little heavier, American female models are getting even skinnier, and the, the distance between the two is, is growing. What is going on? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we are really in a point of crisis where 80% of 10-year-old girls are saying their biggest fear is being fat. So we're seeing rising in eating disorders among girls and boys and the absolute pressure to be thin, to look like these images that girls see in magazines um, that honestly at this point are not even real people in the magazines. They're being photoshopped to cut away parts of their body and make them look even thinner and thinner and thinner. So it's really reaching a point where we need to start pushing back and doing something about it. And your organization is starting to do that. Explain to people how. Yeah, absolutely. So at Spark Movement, we have an amazing team of girls between the ages of 13 and 22 who work with the, the adults in the organization and create activist campaigns that really challenge these unrealistic and dangerous images of, of girls and women in the media. So for example, we had a petition um, a few months ago to Seventeen Magazine demanding that they revise their um, photoshopping policies and declare and promise everybody publicly that they would not photoshop girls' faces and bodies. And 
commit to more diversity in the magazine. And after 86,000 signatures on our petition, we won. And wow. Seventeen Magazine announced in August that they will know that they will never Photoshop girls' faces excuse me, faces and bodies. Uh, Uduak, you know, Dana brought up an interesting point. These are dangerous and unrealistic images. Do you agree with that? Does Absolutely. it rise to that level? Absolutely, and I've been speaking very strongly against that. And I think ultimately the fashion industry to some extent believes it's sort of immune to legal liability and lawsuits, and that might be what is necessary to force change. For example, where you have a celebrity, like you mentioned, Lady Gaga, or maybe someone um, last year, January 2011, we saw Ashwarya Rai with Elle magazine out of India, who was on the cover in January, and what happened? They made her a lot wider than she was. We've mm -hmm. seen so many other Photoshop issues like you guys were raising, and if the law, for example, steps in to say, you know what? you're basically using our image in the wrong way, the way we didn't anticipate with you guys, then with the lawsuit, maybe we can actually drastically change the industry and force them to do what they need to be doing because it is ridiculous what's happening with respect to young girls and their body image based on what they see on the covers of magazines. Well, one of the people or, or things I blame that our community uh, has pinpointed, this from Michelle Anmir, is the advertising industry. She mm -hmm. says it makes money on women's insecurities by promoting unattainable ideals. She says that's to blame as well. But I'd like to go to our, our, our hangout now where Roy is speaking to us from California. And Roy, you're a former Photoshopper. So tell us, why mm. do people Photoshop? <laughs> um, hi, by the way. Um, I'm still a Photoshopper, but it's not, I'm not really so much a, a digital retoucher in respect to dealing with beauty and fashion. But uh, I, I could think of Ganesha, whatever. I'm, I'm not sure what her name was. That you just talked about her tweet. She, I think that she's pretty right on point there. That it's about the ad agencies trying to create a feeling of uh, insecurity within the the, the viewer. The the, it's the potential uh, consumer of their product. So that way they feel if they buy this product, they'll be able to go ahead and feel better about themselves, look better, and be able to uh, achieve this unrealistic uh, perfection, if you will, to go ahead and uh, just buy the product. Hey, Roy, I'm curious. Did you see, before you, before you left that industry, did you see a more extreme version of Photoshopping than maybe three or five or ten years ago? Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, it seems to be that there's a lot more um, body morphing because it, within Photoshop itself there's a uh, filter called liquify <clears throat> and you used to have to go ahead and isolate certain parts of the image like their arm or their waist and be able to separate that and manipulate it certain ways that was a bit time consuming. This way it uh, is you just go into the filter and you just get a brush size and kind of squash the pixels around and you're basically done, except for a little cleanup that might be a little telltale signs of like there was that filter being used. But it's uh, that in relationship also like certain covers that I've seen recently in the past couple of years is that there is a hyper retouched look that seemed to kind of come into fashion for a moment, mm -hmm. and it just looked like there were mannequins. There was plasticizing of the face, and there was a no real contours or even pores that were involved, and that really scared me. Mm -hmm. So you know, Dana, daughter, yeah. So, yeah. Oh, Dana yeah. you work with a lot of Absolutely. young girls. These, Talk about the repercussions Sure. These this. images have a direct impact on girls. There was a recent study that showed that three out of four girls, after spending just three minutes leafing through a magazine, felt guilty, depressed, and ashamed, and hated their bodies even more. That these are images that we are bombarded with all the time, not just in magazines. You can't walk down the street anymore without seeing billboards or turning on your television set or on your cell phone that we are surrounded by this media now 24 hours a day 365 days a year you can't get away from it so the images are just literally absolutely everywhere so they you know we consume them internalize it mm -hmm. and starting from a very early age a tweet absolutely. here from Ivan who says women are pressured to look good from a tender age so it's a part of them any association with bad image is bound to affect them but I'd like to go to our hangout now to talk to Megan, who's a, a video blogger in LA, about some of those, uh, the, the impact of that and what the word fat can be used uh, uh, against women. Yeah, I think the, the word fat is usually used as an insult. And I actually made a video called I Am Fat where I talked about, you know, uh, it's not the word itself that's hurtful or damaging, I think. It's kind of a descriptive term, but it's all the things that are attached with the word fat. It's the idea that fat equals ugly, unloved, unsuccessful, um, the inability to be confident. And for me, especially in video, it's been important to address those issues and to hopefully promote 
um, a positive image of it's not about fitting in a certain box. That's not what happiness is, that you can be another size and you can also be successful and happy and loved and all these things that we kind of assume only thin people can have in the media. So, yeah, that is not a scary word. It's all the things that you attach to it. Yeah. And the dieting industry is a $60 billion industry right now. So it is in many, many corporations' best interest that women are terrified of being fat, just like she said. Okay, but then you have to put that up against this idea that America is more obese than ever. Oh, American women are at an unhealth. Uh, in an, the average American woman weighs 164.7 pounds. So they're, for many of them, that's an unhealthy weight. How do we get a balance between these two, two things? Yeah, we need to raise awareness about what it means to be healthy at every size so that there are ways to be physically look larger maybe, but still be healthy. And that size does not always equal the best possible health. And so now we are definitely seeing that there are, you know, children, um, there's a rise in obesity among children, and we look at the way that we're feeding children, the lack of exercise, um, the processed food. So we need to be creating a healthier society, not just a skinnier society. I guess the way we talk about it, too, I mean, um, in one study, like you were just talking about, I think kids um, that, that were, half of the kids between the ages of three and six were worried about being yeah. overweight. And then we looked at these hashtags, and you can mm -hmm. take a look at this graphic that we'll pull up off of my computer here. Um, the yellow line is mentions of body image, and the blue line, which is wow. way higher, yeah. is mention of weight loss. So we see that our focus is really on weight loss and not on Absolutely. body image. What, I mean, you can see that graph on the screen. What yeah. does that tell you? When, when we're talking so much about weight loss and we're not talking about body image. Right. Absolutely. Well, there's a total disconnect. Being skinnier, losing weight does not always equal positive body image. I mean, you look at the rates of anorexia in this country, which are escalating every year among girls and boys. So physically getting thinner and thinner and thinner is not actually having an impact on the way we see ourselves. And so we need to start changing the conversation about the importance of what girls and women look like and this very narrow idea of beauty. So that, and also the the fact that girls have so many other qualities besides just what they look like. We tell our baby girls from the moment they're born that being pretty is the most important thing in their life. So as they grow up, that becomes the most important thing to them every step of the way instead of their intellect and their athleticism and their kindness and their friendships and all of those other qualities. Well, Uduak, the, there's a tweet here, actually. I, I'd like to hear what you're saying, but I want to direct a question to you uh, first. There's a tweet here from Dana's uh, organization saying marketers want you to dislike yourself and your body because it's easier to sell you things if you trust them more than you trust yourself. Would you agree with that? Uh, designer, uh, we're, no, we're no longer going to be permitting on our magazines uh, images of, of young girls that are underage, mm -hmm. under 16, or you know, have the look of being underweight or, or, or anorexia. In addition, you've seen such a, a change with respect to the CFDA um, taking responsibility um, issuing out since 2007 health guidelines each season now where designers are encouraged to to have girls who look healthy if there are teenagers that are working minors certainly don't have them working past midnight among other guidelines and we're shifting and having a conversation about what healthy models look like and what the healthy american woman but should uduak look like. are they following those guidelines or is are, are creating you know, the guidelines sounds like good pr but are they following through are they following through? That's yeah. a good question because um, I know Diane von Furstenberg um, ha is following, for example, but last year or two years ago, I believe, there was a 15-year-old that modeled for her and she wasn't expecting that to happen. So fall of last year, I believe she said, we're going to make the standards a lot more stringent. We're going to require now that you know models even show their ID so we're sure huh. that indeed they're the age you know that they're claiming they are so I mean there is an effort there's more education that's necessary and and that needs to happen so people can follow the guidelines designers modeling agencies certainly if your client the magazines or the fashion designer is telling the modeling agency look we don't want a certain kind of, of model that's underage that looks skinny really skinny probability is the modeling agency has to satisfy that client and will accordingly comply. So yes, there is an effort to, to begin to follow that, that, that guideline specific to the U.S. Obviously, across the, uh, across the world, it's a completely different story. Well, speaking of across the world, we asked our community who, of course, come from all over what their thoughts were and what their community is saying. This is a tweet from Sam who says, here in Nigeria, bigger is better. Been thin, being thin and beautiful is a Western illusion. 
And mm. uh, Moad says, let me give an example. Whitening cream and weight loss programs are a hit in Asian nations, but white people want to get tanned. Well, he mentioned whitening creams. I'd like to go to Niha mm. in our Google Plus Hangout. Niha is a student at Tufts University. And Niha, can you give us your perspective on, uh, on, on the whitening creams in South Asian communities? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a very big issue here, both in America and in India. Uh, there's one particular brand called Fair and Lovely, and um, it's really, really targeted towards uh, South Indians and darker-skinned Indians, um, particularly in South Asia. It's all about, uh, you know, lightning for marriage prospects, for jobs, for anything really, even within the family. Um, it's a very big issue to be lighter, and um, this is a really big disconnect for us, especially like second-generation um, Indian Americans who come to this country. Um, and grow up here with all of our friends, you know, that are all trying to tan. And here our parents are telling us to stay out of the sun, stay out of the dark, <laughs> uh, getting dark. So it's, it's really difficult to kind of put those two together. Uduak, are there different triggers for skinniness for women from different cultures or different geographic areas? Yeah, and actually it was interesting with the tweet that you mentioned, or someone mentioned from Nigeria. I happen to be Nigerian, born in the USA, but Nigerian-American, and on the pulse of, of what's going on in that particular country. And there's been a remarkable shift. Um, in 1976, when supermodel Iman emerged, the West told us, this is a standard of beauty from the East. East Africans are the standard of beauty. And it wasn't until 1998 when supermodel Aluchi uh, came out of West Africa and became sort of the face of what West African beauty is. But Aluchi is quite skinny. She's skinny and tall like I am. And that's indeed not been the past standard of what beauty is, but that's changing drastically. You've got the Nigerian music industry that's thriving and doing quite well. It, it is what um, South Korean music industry is to Asia. And what's happening is you used to see music videos that provided the strong visuals of women that were plum and fatter and, and considered beautiful. Drastically changed now. Now you have modeling agencies send, sending girls anywhere from 5'10 to 6'2 or 5'7, 5'8, but skinny and tall um, as the epitome of beauty. And I think that's really going to change things. Also, you have uh, uh, Tyra Banks, America's Next Top Model, coming to Africa, and specifically supermodel Aluchi will be hosting that. And I think, again, we're going to see a drastic shift. It's already happening. It used to be when I was growing up, I fantasize about, you know, plum, fatter women being the ideal image of how I would be beautiful because I was told I was gorgeous, but too skinny, so not quite beautiful enough. And now it's, it's, it's a shift. I now hear African girls t saying they want to be skinny yeah. like me or tall like me or like the images they now see on magazines or their television shows because they consume so much of the Western culture mm -hmm on the notions of beauty. So I think that's that's interesting and changing. Dana, I rarely yeah. hear men saying that their ideal woman is stick skinny. In fact, I generally hear the opposite. Right. And my girlfriends that are try constantly trying to lose weight and be super yeah. skinny, their male partners are like, you're skinny enough, don't get any skin. Are we doing this to ourselves? To an extent, yes. I mean, I. I I don't want to say that every woman is always thinking of what a man wants her to look like. And so when we look around us and the entire culture is saying skinny is good, fat is bad, and if you're overweight, you, will, you are lazy, you are, you know, you're not going to get that job, you're going to have all of these negative outcomes. Um, we are creating an environment where it is the assumption that being thin will make you happy. And we are putting that pressure upon ourselves based on um, fitting into this much larger cultural conversation about what beauty is. Well, Roy, I want your thoughts on whether or not men are also putting that pressure on themselves. There's a tweet here from Selma who says, men today seem to be more conscious about their looks than women to the extent that they seem to have begun to compete with women. Did you Photoshop mm -hmm. men as well? Hmm. Yeah, definitely Photoshop men as well, but it, there's not near as much uh, work that's done to them. It's, it's, I've noticed that there's times when there's an ad, ad campaign when they're trying to show a young man that's very athletic. They want to make sure that the definition is there and that their 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 muscles are you know defined and there's uh, abs and etc. But uh, when it comes to just in general, there'll be uh, an ad with a woman and a man. There is always a lot of attention given to the women, and then the uh, the retouching for the men is like they're always saying, "Well, don't worry about that. We obviously know there's not that much that needs to be done with the guys." So there is that aspect of it, but I do believe that with advertising and this 
over sexualization with uh, mm. trying to sell products with men and women that men nowadays too become very self-conscious about the way that they look. Do they go ahead and have a certain a certain style? Do they look athletic enough? Do they seem to go ahead and the, the, the ironic thing is that I was skinny when I was in junior high school. It was an issue for me. It was not cool. I was very insecure. But now it seems to be very cool. It seems to be like okay for guys to be skinny too. So it, it I think in that aspect, it definitely has a thing uh, that the, the boys now and young men now have an issue with competing with women. Uh, Uduak, you know, African American female friends of mine are constantly laughing at white women trying to be real skinny and trying to obtain these unrealistic goals of thinness. I'd love your opinion on why the African-American female community hasn't internalized, or at least internalized as much, this unrealistic message that the media pushes. I think because, uh, I mean, African-American men, uh, in, in my own experience and just being within the community locally here, um, appreciate women with curves. It's always been the case. There's no need to go on some dieting or, you know, try to make yourself you know what you're not and so you know the 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 more bones and meat you have on your bones the better so i think culturally it's still nothing that's uh you know frowned on and you can see parallels also with africa certainly african men generally in spite of the growth of of skinnies in that the western uh, culture promulgates over in africa are of the same mindset for the most part yes you do have a lot of african men prefer preferring that you have uh, meat uh, on on your your, your bones, so to speak, meat on the body for them to uh, to, to find you attractive. Mm -hmm. So it's it's culturally not on the same level. I mean, there there there's just two distinct cultures. There's there's no need to worry about your weight like that. Although it depends. though, you do have the um, the music videos again that are painting certain kind of images of women. But even then, I don't think it's it's is it is as extreme as you see in you know among Caucasians. And there are also African-American female celebrities that are going very public about losing weight, like Jennifer Hudson and Queen Latifah, and even Oprah, who talk very openly about wanting to lose weight all the time. And also, but aside from weight, in, in using the race issue, there's a tweet from Crystal who says, whitewashing is a big issue. Many celebrities are whitened on magazine covers to promote the standard ideal of beauty white. And of course, that goes back to the conversation we were have, uh, having about the South Asian community with Neha and her hangout. But I'd like to go to Megan now in our hangout um, uh, to, to talk about an issue that was raised a little bit earlier. There's a tweet from Selma who says, the media is controlled by powerful males who influence ordinary males into having the same expectations mm -hmm. of all females. I want your thoughts on this as a video blogger. Are women being too hard on each other or are you blaming men? I, I think it's unfair to go into it blaming men. I think, I think we all have a part in it. I think um, there definitely is this idealized sense of beauty that comes from like what men want. But we do play into that too. I think we have a lot more power than we give ourselves credit for. And I have often found that women are the cruelest to each other. We are the ones who kind of keep up that standard of what we teach our daughters and um, what we say to our friends about the way that they look and the way that they should look. We're the ones that are consuming it. I feel like media would have to change the game up a little bit if we didn't consume the content that they're putting out. If they had to start putting people of different sizes in magazines or be more aware of other body types, um, I think that they're, they just want to make money. Like that at the end of the day. And what we are buying is what's going to sell. All right, we're going to uh, continue this conversation on our online post show. So thanks to all of our guests. Please sit tight uh, because we're going to pick it up here in a few minutes. Now, on tomorrow's program, we are going to talk about African states. Uh, they're usually portrayed as lacking good leaders. But are they being unfairly singled out? We're going to examine why in only the last six years, only three former heads of states there have been recognized for achievement in African leadership. So send us your thoughts on that. Send us some video questions. And until then, we'll see you online.
Welcome back to the Stream's online post show. We're discussing issues of body image as media portrayals become more and more, if this is even possible, more unrealistic. With us in studio is Dana Adele. She's the executive director of Spark. Um, Let's pick up with some tweets. We've got so much community interaction on this topic. I actually want to start with a video comment. And Uduak, if you could have a listen to this, this was left by a member of our community. I'm Janan from the UAE. Uh, I think that mainstream Western portrayals of certain beauty standards uh, definitely has an effect uh, in other countries. Uh, you can see that, you know, people wearing high heels to make them look taller, the diet fads that keep coming and going, and even the rise of eating disorders. I think in the UAE, one in 50 girls has an eating disorder. That says it has a big influence, but I wouldn't say it dictates, because local culture and custom, religion, all affect uh, local perceptions of beauty. So, Udurak, of course, mm. you touched on that in the main show, but I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit more on what local customs uh, does to that. Yeah, I, I agree with that comment. And I think locally, um, you know, you're influenced by culture. It used to be, for example, in the eastern part of Nigeria, and it still happens, not just Nigeria, other African countries. Um, for women to prepare for marriage, they had to be sent to fattening rooms or fat fattening mm -hmm. homes where they were prepped up and fed until they became curvaceous and had enough fat that would be able to, or curves that would be able to please their men. So local customs are indeed very, very important. However, the potency and power of Western culture is not to be underestimated. And when you have uh, countries that are saturated with a lot of this Western consumerism, uh, for example, the big country, the bigger countries in Africa, Nigeria, uh, South Africa, Ghana, Kenya even, you're starting to see a shift where that's being embraced and, and the definitions of beauty start changing and local young girls now want to be the skinny African celebrity on TV who is, you know, emulating exactly what she's seen on uh, Western TVs. Well, check this out, Uduak. You mentioned the potency and power of Western culture and how that trickles down to children being affected at younger and younger ages. In one study, nearly half of three to six year olds expressed being fear of overweight. So, when Barney's New York, that's a luxury department store in New York, transformed Disney characters into runway models for an upcoming <laughs> holiday campaign, many saw this as the wrong message. Check out these designs. They show characters like Goofy, and then we've got there's Daisy wow. Duck, who's normally plump like a duck, and Minnie Mouse. They're all extremely thin and tall, instead of having their normal cartoonish childlike figures. Dana, what does this tell you? Yeah, I mean, we're seeing that in toys all the time. If you look at the My Little Ponies from the 80s when I used to play with My Little Ponies when I was a kid, and now the My Little Pony is like curvy with like a little booty and has like skinny slender legs and longer hair. So we are not only making all of these childhood that We're sexualizing characters, the animals too? We're totally sexualizing them. Yeah, absolutely. And so it's creating an incredibly dangerous and also very unrealistic ideal about what children should look like and play with. Well, the, the uh, pervasiveness of this is referenced in this next tweet from Skelly, who says, The legacy of sexism is so strong that even an elite like Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State, was bullied about her slightly non-conforming appearance. So is anyone immune? It doesn't seem to be. Um, when These are the images that we see absolutely everywhere, and when we reward girls for fitting them and punish them for not fitting them, it makes it a lot harder to resist. Why do you think things have changed so much? I mean, in the 1950s, we saw Marilyn Monroe in the United States as the I ideal woman, and she was very, very curvy. And now, you know, not that many decades later, it's the complete opposite. Yeah, I mean, it's an excellent question, and there are several theories. I mean, one of them is um, the dieting industry is a $60 billion industry. So that, for one, is convincing people that they need to lose weight because there's so much money to be made. Um, the early sexualization and the sexualization across the board can somewhat be attributed to the ways that porn has become completely accessible over the last 10 to mm. 15 years on the Internet. Internet yeah. So the images that we are seeing are we're expecting that kind of sexualized pornographic images all the time because those are the images that are being repeated and repeated and repeated and so advertisers need to compete with other advertisers for the, the most sensational image so that they can sell their product and so they're turning towards sex or towards violent images and towards you know very dangerous and unrealistic images. Well Megan and our Google Plus Hangout I know you have a follow-up go ahead. Um, I was just saying that I think one of the important things that we don't talk about often and I'm really super um, positive about is the idea between size and health. Um, we often, you know, want people to be thin or people that troll on my videos will want me to be thin because they say I'm concerned about your health. 
Um, and I think that we have this uh, perception and idea of what health and size is. It, there are a lot of people of different varying body ranges that are unhealthy or healthy. You can be thin and unhealthy, you can be big and unhealthy. And people often look at people of size and think, oh, they're, they're lazy or they sit around all day and they eat horribly. But they know someone who's 120 pounds that does the same thing, but because it's not something that they carry around with them, it's fine. Um, and I would, I would just say that we need to be very aware of um, the things that we promote and the, the education behind it. Because we're not, we can't just teach people of size um, how to be thin. We have to teach people how to be healthy and be aware that there is no such thing as a bad body. Like all bodies are good and uh, it's important that we don't stigmatize people for the way that they might just naturally be. Well, Uruk, I'd like you to follow up on that, especially because of this tweet from uh, Takunwa, who says, traditionally, in most parts of Africa, being slim is a sign of not feeding well. Indeed. Indeed, it's, it's, it's always been the case. Again, when I was growing up, um, I mean, I, I ate so much. Uh, my, my siblings and I are all skinny and tall, and uh, yet I was always told that I wasn't, a, I was attractive, but not quite attractive enough um, because I was skinny. Um, so that that's indeed true. I, I just wanted to add a, a point to what was made with respect to how we came from Marilyn Monroe to, to where we are now. And I think, again, back to the fashion industry, there was an evolution of some sorts over time where designers discovered that, you know, their clothes look better on tall, skinny models, the whole human hanger thing that we hear about. And essentially that backed with a very strong advertising industry and we we're able to change the, the standard of beauty, not only within the US, but globally. But yes, coming back to the point of that last tweet, um, skinny means you're not fitting well. It used to be the case uh, when you wanted to see if someone was wealthy, they had a big gut and, you know, the women had a big booty, but now that that's really, really uh, again changing uh, in, in an in an industry like Nigeria, for example, and its entertainment industry, celebrities are now going on diet uh, on diet changes. They're exercising. That's unheard of. It used to be before males that were cut were considered unattractive. Now you've got a lot of male celebrities with six packs and in the gym. I mean, it's, it's just been a very interesting shift and revolution with respect to what mm -hmm. beauty is coming from the USA and how we uh, shape the global image of beauty. Hey, Roy, I'm, I'm curious. I think women would feel a lot better about looking at these images if they could look at them and they were stamped. This image has been retouched or photoshopped. Is there a way for a person to look at an image and identify it as being severely retouched? Um, yeah, I did. Before I get into like what you know, what to look for, uh, there is uh, there there are, there's a group that's actually trying to go ahead and get a uh, grading system when it comes to retouching from like a one to five, five being the most extreme and one being least you know, manipulated. <clears throat> and I think that that's a that's a pretty good viable way of doing it and in, and bringing awareness to the fact that there is a certain level of retouching to it. But there's also, I think, it's a greater issue with being uh, more aware of the fact that there's, in other words, trying to bring down the level of retouching. Of course. Now, tell but, us how to identify the ones that have been retouched. What are uh, the tricks? There's ways, sorry, um, that there is perfect, like silhouettes that are going on. There might be uh, there are no bags under the eyes. Eye whitening of eyes and teeth uh, to an extreme. That's the first telltale sign. Um, being able to go ahead and notice that there's no blemishes on the face, if there's any kind of lack of, uh, of uh, to, to kind of a gradation between protruding body parts from the face other than the cheeks. And uh, it's it, those are the first few things to go ahead and really look for. So if it's too perfect to be real, it's probably not real. Dana, yeah. we've got about 30 seconds left. I want you to wrap it up for us. Great. Well, I think I do want to be clear that there are ways to push back and that there are people, Spark, and lots of organizations that we work with are taking action. And part of what Roy was saying is raising awareness about what we are looking at and how we're being manipulated is definitely the first step, and also creating our own media, um, creating our own images, writing our own stories, really being the voices that we want to hear and telling our stories is definitely a way to push back as well. Dana Adele, thank you so much. Thank you to the rest of our guests. We were, uh, for tomorrow, on Tuesday's show, African states portrayed as lacking good leaders. Is that fair or are they being unfairly singled out? That's the topic for tomorrow's show. Until then, we'll see you online.